So now he he comes in front of Alma, and the, the showdown begins in verse 31. Notice he did rise up in great swelling words before Alma and did revile against the priests and the teachers, accusing them of leading away the people after the silly traditions of their fathers for the sake of glutting on the labors of the people. So interesting that a, that a person inspired by the devil would throw that accusation. The being who doesn't want to do any work but wants all of the benefit, that's Satan. He wasn't willing to sacrifice his life for us like Jesus was, but he wanted us to do all the work and him to get all the glory and all of the benefit. The irony is thick. The conversation goes on in this initial phase. Now look at verse 39. Now Alma said unto him, Will ye deny again that there is a God, and also deny the Christ? For behold, I say unto you, I know there is a God, and also that Christ shall come. So he bears his testimony very firmly, very resolutely uh, to, to Korihor here. And then verse 40 is beautiful. Now what evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that ye have none, save it be your word only. But it's interesting that in this case Korihor is laying the burden of proof at the feet of Alma, saying, basically prove it, and we're going to see that here in a minute. You can't prove that there isn't a God. In fact, it was uh, Elder Gerald Lund years and years ago in an Enzyme article who talked about this. He said, in order to prove that there isn't a God, you would have to be able to go into all parts of the vast universe looking for him and find no evidence of, of divinity. And then he said, the only problem is, is by the time you get through looking through all parts of the universe, God could have moved. So he said, to really prove that there is no God, what you have to do is have your mind be able to contemplate every square inch of the, or cubic inch of the vast expanse of the universe in an instant. And only a God can do that. Brothers and sisters, the existence of God is not intended to be something proved by scientific inquiry or by, by scientific evidence. It's a matter of faith, and I love the fact that here Alma is saying, look at verse 41, behold, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true, and ye also have all things as a testimony unto you that they are true, and will you deny them? He's saying, look, everywhere I look, I'm seeing signs of a God, and you're seeing signs of a non, non-existence of a God, but you can't prove it, nor can I prove to you, but I can bear my testimony to you and I can, I can explain the witnesses that I've seen. At this point, Korihor shifts the discussion. Look at verse 43. Now Korihor said unto Alma, if thou wilt show unto me a sign, that I may be convinced that there is a God, yea, show unto me that he hath power, and then will I be convinced of the truth of thy words. Alma, let's make this really simple. Show me a sign. Prove it. Prove that God lives. Then I'll believe. Let me see it. Then I'll believe it. That, that whole doctrine or that, that foundation of seeking truth is a wonderful one when it comes to scientific inquiry, when it comes to things of the earth, physical laws, that is wonderful to, to use that scientific method of, I've got to see it, then I'll believe it. I, I personally don't want to get onto an airplane of somebody who has just fasted and prayed but has no scientific experimentation or built on laws of nature and, and lots of tests and trials and errors to discover how to best make an airplane. I, I don't want to get on an airplane built by faith alone. In, uh, I just don't. So the let me see it, then believe it is a wonderful way to seek truth when it comes to things of the physical, natural world in which we live, but it's not a good way to seek truth with things of eternity. The Book of Mormon later on is going to teach us that we receive no witness until after the trial of our faith, which means we have to believe first and then 
C second. It's only after the trial that we get the witness. So now watch what happens with this sign-seeking. If you'll show me a sign, then I'll believe. <clears throat> it was Jesus who taught the doctrine that it is a wicked and an adulterous generation that seeketh after signs. Joseph Smith repeated that doctrine once when he said sign-seekers are adulterers, basically, is the concept that he taught. Uh, that's odd. What, what does sign-seeking and adultery have in common that would make them so connected in the mind of the Savior that he would teach that? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after signs. Think about what an adulterer uh, wants and what they're willing to do. An adulterer is not willing to work and to pay the price to go through a long phase of, of dating and courtship and engagement and marriage in order to enjoy those particular aspects of, of married life. They don't want to go to all the work, they just want what they want right here, right now, and they don't care what it costs because they just – they want that, that passion or that desire fed in the immediate present. What is sign-seeking? I don't want to have to go to the work of reading my scriptures and praying and fasting and going to church and serving and paying tithing and struggling to gain a testimony of these things. I just – I want what I want and I want it right now, but I don't want to have to work for it. So just show me a sign, let's cut to the chase, let me just see what I want to see, and then I'll believe at that point. Done. It didn't cost me anything, I didn't have to put anything into this, but I get all of the benefit with none of the pain or none of the labor leading up to it. Notice that uh, Alma tells him, you've had signs enough, verse 44, and he, he continues to press Korahor on this, saying, you, you know more, you know better, and are you going to keep denying? You're going to do this? Look at verse 48. Now Korahor said unto him, I do not deny the existence of a God, but I do not believe that there is a God, and I say also that you do not know that there is a God, and except ye show me a sign, I will not believe. Hmm, that's odd. Our chief atheist in the Book of Mormon, who, who didn't believe in the existence of God and the existence of Christ, he doesn't really say that as much, but everything he's talking about, there's no life after this life, there's nothing to be gained from the past, everything he's describing is godless, it's atheistic. But now, in verse 48, he shifts and he becomes fully agnostic, an agnostic saying, I don't know and I don't think you know and I don't think anyone can know. Well, watch this. Look at verse 49. Alma said unto him, this will I give unto thee for a sign, thou shalt be struck dumb according to my words. And I say that in the name of God ye shall be struck dumb, that ye shall no more have utterance. And at that point, Korahor is struck dumb. He can't speak anymore. So look at verse 52. First thing he writes, Korahor put forth his hand and wrote, saying, I know that I am dumb, for I cannot speak. And I know He's bearing testimony now as he writes this, I know that nothing save it were the power of God could bring this upon me, yea, and I always knew that there was a God. I always knew that there is a God. Turns out he's a theist all along, the entire – I always knew. So your question for Korahor at this point would be, uh, really? Then why did you do what you did? Why did you teach what you taught? He answers it before we even ask the question. Look at verse 53. But behold, the devil hath deceived me, for he appeared unto me in the form of an angel and said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have all gone astray after an unknown God. And he said unto me, There is no God. Now at that point, pause. You would want Korahor to ask a few questions of that angel, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want him to say something like, really? If there's no God, then where did you come from? Who sent you? And why did you care to come? 
And if there really is no God, then what difference does it make what anybody believes, really? At the end of the day, nothing matters. And why, why do you care so much, angel, if there is no God? But Korihor didn't ask any of those questions. Look what he says. I taught his words, and I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind, and I taught them even until I had much success, insomuch that I verily believed they were true. Because they pleased the carnal mind, and so many people seemed to follow and believe them true as well, I believed that they were true. And so then you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, if you show me a sign, then I will uh, be able to believe. So now he's had his sign, now he should be able to believe, right? But his, in, his uh, declaration was, I've always believed. I didn't need Elma to show me a sign to believe in God because I always knew there was a God. I've just been teaching these things because they were so pleasing and so many people liked them. But that was a good good lesson for me. I, I've learned it. Now let's move on. I'm, I'm ready to, to be a good guy now. Look at verse 54. Now when he had said this, he besought that Alma should pray unto God that the curse might be taken from him. Brothers and sisters, verse 54 for me is one of the saddest verses in this entire chapter because what it tells me is that nothing has changed. Korihor hasn't really changed. He just doesn't like the consequence that he's now experiencing, but his heart is no different than it was before because he's doing the same thing as he was before. He's turning to somebody else to do all of the work for him so that he can get the rewards and the fruits and the benefits of that labor. I don't know. I have no authority for these things, but I believe with all my heart that if verse 54 had said, and it came to pass that Korihor fell to the ground and he poured out his whole soul and his heart to God, pleading for a remission of his sins and his iniquities and for all that he had done to lead away so many hearts away from Christ, pleading to know what God would have him to do to to be forgiven of these sins, I think we would have had a different ending to the story. I think we would have seen a changed heart turning to God, asking for, for direction on what God would have him do, and he would be willing to do it meekly. And then I think the next verse might have said, and it came to pass that Korihor was passed out for three days, because that seems to always be the pattern when people are making this kind of a transition, but we don't see that because Korihor's heart doesn't seem to have changed. He's turning to Alma saying, you take this away from me because I've learned my lesson. I'm a, I'm a good boy now. Look at verse 55. But Alma said unto him, if this curse should be taken from thee, thou wouldst again lead away the hearts of this people. Therefore it shall be unto thee even as the Lord wilt. So he, he's saying, look, I'm not going to take it away but if, because I think you're going to keep leading people astray. But if God wants to take it away, I'll let him. God doesn't. Now Korihor goes down among the Zoramites in, uh, in Antionum. This is the one place among the Nephites where people should have embraced him and, and celebrated him. But notice what happened. Bottom of verse 58, Korihor did go about from house to house begging food for his support. His doctrine isn't going very well now. He told us before that every man prospers according to his genius, so every dog for himself, right? Well, now it's not going very well for him as he's begging. And it came to pass that as he went forth among the people, yea, among a people who had separated themselves from the Nephites, called themselves Zoramites, being led by a man whose name was Zoram, and as he went forth amongst them, behold, he was run upon and trodden down even until he was dead. Mormon couldn't hold himself back. He has to jump in and say, did, did you get it? Did you see the message? Look at this. It comes to us in two thus we see in verse 60. Thus we see the end of him who perverteth the ways of the Lord, and thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. 
you'll notice a little contrast on your scripture page there, if you have your physical scriptures open. You could circle the word drag because that's what Satan does. He drags people down to hell. Look at the contrast uh, over in chapter 31, verse 5, just right next to it on the page. Now, as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just. Contrast zot with not zot. Contrast good with evil. Christ with Satan. Satan drags, Christ leads. He will never force anyone into heaven. He will never reach into your heart and squeeze you and say, you will love me. That is not his way. He will lead you with kindness, gentleness, meekness, persuasion, love unfeigned, all of those beautiful things in section 121 that he describes. That's how God does his work. Now, as we say farewell to Korahor and turn our attention to chapter 31 with the Zoramites, just know that his doctrine is appealing. There is a part of our being that would very much like to have his doctrine be true if we let it go. But, brothers and sisters, there is no happiness in following that, that doctrine or allowing those dominoes to keep, to keep falling and thinking we're going to somehow find lasting or enduring joy. It doesn't exist. That will only lead us to be bound more and more and more with more flax and cords from the devil, allowing him to drag us more and more against our will versus turning to the Lord, saying, I want thee to be my God and I want to be thy people and moving forward in faith.